CBT treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, by presenters Anil Veer Grewal, Stephanie Lowe, and Abdurrahman Murad. Today's presentation will be covering overview of symptoms of PTSD, physiological changes, cognitive behavioral therapy overview, different treatment options for PTSD using CBT approach, preferable treatment options for PTSD, case study, benefits, ethical concerns and limitations, and conclusion. Post-traumatic stress disorder, commonly known as PTSD, is a syndrome that may affect an individual who has witnessed a traumatic event, which may lead to incidences such as an accident, rape, or combat. Mann and Marwa mention a general guideline, which indicates that traumatic events differ from individual to individual. Overall, no one is immune to PTSD and one who is diagnosed with PTSD would avoid situations that evoke memories of the initial trauma. According to DSM-5, the diagnostic criteria for PTSD applies to adults, adolescents, and children older than six years of age. After initial trauma, an individual would have to have more one or more of the five intrusion, intrusion symptoms associated with the traumatic event. In addition to this, an individual would experience persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the traumatic events beginning after the trauma has occurred. This would cause one to exhibit one or both of the symptoms associated with avoidance. Negative alterations in cognitions and mood will be visible. The presence of two or more of the seven listed symptoms would be an indication. Lastly, alterations in arousal and reactivity would be visible as well. This would be clear with the presence of two or more of the six listed symptoms. Individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder will see changes in brain and bodily functions. Depending on the severity of the PTSD, different physiological responses can be activated negatively to respond to the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors surrounding this anxiety disorder. The brain is equipped with an alarm system that helps to ensure our survival. With PTSD, individuals can expect that the system becomes overly sensitive and triggered easily. As a result, the parts of the brain responsible for thinking and memory have compromised functioning. When this happens, it becomes difficult to decipher between safe events happening now from events that are dangerous and took place in the past. Science and medicine has permitted methods such as neuroimaging to see how PTSD can cause distinct biological changes to the brain. However, not everybody with PTSD will have the exact same symptoms or the similar changes in the brain. There are obvious patterns that can be understood and treated as a result of this scientific method. The parts of the brain where the most changes take place are in the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, and the hippocampus. These brain regions have different functional purposes, especially when responding to PTSD. The amygdala hyperactivates when you experience a disturbing event, sending a signal that causes a fear response, also referred to as the alarm system. Those with PTSD tend to have an overactive response. So, something as harmless as a loud noise from a car can instantly trigger the individual. The prefrontal cortex helps you think through decisions, observe how you're thinking, and put on the brakes, also known as the brake system, when you realize something you first feared isn't actually a threat. Your prefrontal cortex helps regulate emotional responses triggered by the amygdala. 
In individuals with PTSD, the prefrontal cortex doesn't always manage to do its job when required. Other PTSD symptoms or experiences, such as unwanted feelings that pop up out of nowhere or always being on the lookout for threats that could lead to more trauma, seem to be related to the hippocampus, the memory center of your brain. When both the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex are compromised, the individual will experience changes such as feeling anxious around anything even slightly related to the original trauma, having strong physical reactions to situations that shouldn't provoke a fear reaction, and avoiding situations that may trigger intense emotions and reactions. Some of the common physical and emotional reactions associated with PTSD that can be considered arousal symptoms are being easily startled or frightened, always being on guard for danger and engaging in self-destructive behavior, including substance abuse, such as drinking too much, or dangerous behaviors, such as driving too fast. Other expected physical or emotional reactions may include trouble sleeping or concentrating, irritability, angry outbursts, aggressive behavior, as well as a sense of overwhelming shame. It is important to note that anyone can be affected by PTSD. Sometimes the individual has not experienced the traumatic event themselves, but may have had a family member or a close friend experience a situation of imminent danger, such as exposure to a life or death situation. An individual may also be unaware that they are suffering from PTSD, and therefore these arousal symptoms may serve as an indication that one should seek help. Modern CBT has two influences, behavior therapy and cognitive therapy. Both emotional reactions and behavior are strongly influenced by cognitions, which may include thoughts, images, beliefs, and interpretations, as well as how individuals give meaning to the events that have taken place in their lives. CBT is an empirically supported treatment that is dedicated to changing the way one thinks and behaves in order to change the way one feels and responds. CBT is based on the principle that emotions and behaviors are triggered by negative, unseemly, inappropriate or irrational thinking patterns called automatic thoughts or automat automatic cognitions. The intertwined cognitive and behavioral approach challenges cognitive distortions, negative perceptions of self and behaviors to be replaced with positive emotional coping strategy, solving present day issues, concerns, and ultimately improving one's overall ability to regulate difficult emotions. CBT hones in on techniques that are des designed to help individuals identify, reflect, and modify their inner thoughts. A significant portion of treatment in CBT is dedicated to working with automatic thoughts. Automatic thoughts are all the thoughts we experience daily that are noticeable if we pay attention to them. These can be thoughts that are positive, negative, or neutral. The negative automatic thoughts that occur are the ones we focus on in CBT. Negative automatic thoughts, NAT, are those we interpret and give meaning to, and CBT combats the inaccuracy of these NATs. Figure 1.3 shows different levels of cognitive of cognition an individual with negative automatic thoughts may experience. Here, we can see how the client interprets experiences and highlight negative core beliefs that are maintaining the negative cognitive triad. This includes self-perception, view of others, and overall worldview. CBT is utilized to shift negative core beliefs and modify them to yield positive thought processes and promote cognitive and behavioral strategies for more adaptive responses to negative experiences. Introducing CBT treatment options for PTSD. 
This presentation will explore cognitive restructuring, group therapy, and prolonged exposure therapy. Cognitive restructuring, or CR, is a technique used to understand sad feelings and unhappy moods. It is a helpful technique to counter negative automatic thoughts. It is one of the core components of CBT. Gladding defined it as a cognitive therapeutic process for coping with stress that involves replacing stress provoking or irrational thoughts with more constructive or rational thoughts, thus helping patients recognize and modify their inner dialogue and develop coping self statements. CR is suitable for an array of mental illnesses and is a viable treatment for substance abuse, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Clark states that cognitive restructuring based therapy focuses on two general issues, identifying key disorder relevant schemas and learning to substitute more normal adaptive schemas about the self, world, and future. Specialized programs that offer CR based therapy contain three critical components, collaborative empiricism, verbal intervention, and empirical hypo hypothesis testing. A session will start with the client's general description of the problematic situation they are facing. Thereafter, with the help of the counselor, they will identify the feelings they experience and identify the thoughts they are having. Here, the counselor will help the client identify cognitive distortions, which are inaccurate thought patterns. These distortions would be challenged and a new, more balanced thought pattern will be adopted. There are a few drawbacks and potential limitations with the CR only approach. Eifert and Forsyth indicate that it may lead to maladaptive coping strategy and would have the uh, potential of teaching a client to suppress their unwanted thoughts. Grande spoke to the limitations of CBT, and one of his observations would be applicable to the CR-only approach to therapy, stating that CR may appear to be cold and mechanistic. Furthermore, it would appear the lack of clarity and structure. Clark states, unfortunately, the treatment process of research has not yet matured to the point where it can provide guidelines to clinicians on when to use it when to combine it with other interventions, or when to refrain from its use altogether. CBT group therapy is recommended to be implemented as an early intervention and prevention model for individuals with anxiety disorders. Group programming at an early stage can offset the severe anxiety symptoms that may arise if left untreated. Group programming generally reduces the amount of anxiety-prone situations and environments as a result of early intervention to build self-regulation and management strategies. Group models offer positive peer modeling opportunities, reinforcement, and social support. It can also be a more convenient option and it is more accessible than one-to-one -one services, which may include barriers such as wait lists. Some benefits may include the therapist's ability to work with more people in one session than with individual treatments. Participants may find it helpful to meet others who live with similar difficulties as they can provide peer support and share their personal experiences. And finally, for individuals with social fears, group formats can provide social exposure opportunities. Although everyone's PTSD may have been developed through different situations, events, or is perhaps an accumulation of events from the past, CBT group therapy will focus on changing what is maintaining the anxiety in the present. Group therapy sessions commonly have the following format. They start the session with a check-in on each group member. 
They will then transition into what they have worked on since the last session. All participants will review their homework and report on the progress of their goals. And the therapist will guide the group members through learning a new CBT skill and or practice the new skill. Skills learned assist in facing fears. This is done gradually and repeatedly during both group and individual sessions. However, in group formats, it is easier to challenge negative cognitions due to peer involvement and safe, supportive environments. An example may include one being afraid of engaging in small talk in public. One will be asked to practice this skill repeatedly until they become more comfortable. Within this CBT process, the patient will learn skills to challenge anxiety-provoking thoughts. Limitations of CBT in groups include population demographic research, as group CBT proves to be most suitable for children in adolescent populations over young adults or older adults. The reason for this is that PTSD manifests over time and becomes increasingly complex the longer it is left untreated. Adults will normally require more intensive intervention approaches than children and adolescents who may have the opportunity to manage their anxiety sooner. For example, the Coping Cat program is one of the most studied CBT group programs for anxiety disorders in children and adolescents. It is a 16-week program with the first eight weeks dedicated to basic CBT concepts. The remaining eight sessions are centered on new skill development around responding to anxiety-inducing situations. Conclusions of the study determine that upon follow-up, follow the outcomes from this program are maintained up to one year and more. Exposure therapy is based in the Pavlovian conditioning model. When a neutral stimulus, CS, is followed by an aversive stimulus, US, with enough significant and consistent pairings, the neutral CS will elicit anticipatory fear reactions, which we call the conditional response, the CR. The CR will depend on the CS becoming a reliable predictor of the US. An association is created within the individual's memory between the CS and the US such that the CS will activate the memory of the US. What does this mean? Now, thinking about the aversive US will elicit fear. Fear conditioning is considered a valid model for many anxiety disorders, including panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, specific phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. In consideration of the Pavlovian model, the individual being repeatedly exposed to the fear-provoking stimuli in the absence of the repeated aversive outcome is the clinical proxy of extinction and exposure therapies. Wolf presented the idea in a form of systematic desensitization, and this model is derived from early models of extinction learning. Prolonged exposure is an excellent therapy for PTSD. Boysen and Kagi state prolonged exposure therapy has accrued substantial empirical evidence to show it as an effective treatment. According to Russell, prolonged exposure therapy is a trauma-focused exposure-based treatment initially developed for adults with PTSD following exposure to diverse types of trauma. The APA generally describes the nature of PE therapy. They state, it is a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy that teaches individuals to gradually approach trauma-related memories, feelings, and situations. Individuals work with their therapist in a safe, graduated fashion to face stimuli in situations that evoke fear and remind them of the trauma to increase their comfort and reduce their fear. The idea is that with repeated exposure, the trauma and triggers 
they have become recognized as memories as opposed to a threat in the present moment. Here we present a case study of Melissa, a 32-year-old woman who survived a sexual assault approximately eight months ago. She experiences intrusive memories of the trauma as well as situational avoidance. Melissa avoids social situations unless accompanied by one or more people she trusts and knows well. She feels very unsafe. She is particularly uncomfortable with situations, including alcohol, as she believes this may trigger violence. Melissa always carries pepper spray, pepper spray as a form of protection. Melissa has goals of pursuing a romantic relationship, but is highly fearful. Melissa agreed to a series of prolonged exposure therapy treatments, weekly treatments for three months for a total of 12 sessions. She was comfortable knowing this is an evidence-based approach that proves to be more effective than other types of treatments. During the first session, Melissa is introduced to informed consent, the theoretical model, and the collaborative approach to CBT. Melissa is invited to tell the therapist the story of her trauma, and she continues to repeat the story over subsequent sessions. The rapport and non-judgment demonstrated within the therapeutic relationship helps Melissa build confidence in being able to share her story with close, trusted family and friends and assist in breaking down fears of blame, shame, judgment, and the overall fear. With the repetition of sharing the story of the trauma, she, it becomes more of a memory than an actual immediate experience. The cognitive intervention includes identifying these maladaptive cognitions, exploring and restructuring them prior to, post, and during exposure. Melissa will be exposed to situations that feel dangerous to her, but are not. What has been avoided due to her fears will be faced. The combination of both retelling the story and exposure to avoided situations will allow Melissa to engage in her life once again. She can resume regular social activities and have the confidence to pursue, pursue her relationship goals. The following two slides will present sample exposure activities and the associated cognitions. Sample A exposure may take place on session 4 of 12. After the patient has had the opportunity to verbally review the trauma and stimulus with the therapist and has had some opportunities to review with a trusted family member or friend, the patient will engage in regular exposure using a recording four times per week. It is a visualization exercise where the goal is to complete 20 minutes of exposure by listening to a recording of the story. The patient will record their fear or negative cognition in their journal or on a worksheet and will rate the likelihood of this fear playing out. Once the patient has completed the activity, they will note if the fear occurred and explore cognitions post exposure. The patient may also like to note any cognitions they experience during exposure and challenge any expectations or cognitions in their journal and with the therapist. Strategies and techniques will be identified and introduced as needed to successfully withstand exposure. Reviewing the exposure as written, we can see the goal is to conduct visualization for 20 minutes, listening to the recording four times per week. The patient will be asked to note their greatest concern. Melissa notes that it is a fear that she will not be able to complete the recording. The patient is then asked to rate on a scale of zero to 100 how likely it is that this fear will occur, and she rates at 90%. After exposure, did the major concern occur? Melissa notes no. The patient is able to stay and complete the recording four times a week all the way through to completion. And what was learned? Systematic desensitization. Melissa can begin to face these scary moments and recognize there is no immediate danger. 
Our second example of an exposure activity. The goal here is to attend a resto bar one evening alone for 40 minutes without her pepper spray. Melissa will be asked to note her greatest concern, which is a fear to be approached by men who have been drinking, who will be aggressive and put their hands on her. Next, on a scale of 0 to 100, she was asked to rate how likely it is that this is to occur, and she says 70%. After the exposure, did the major concern occur? No. Some men approached, but everyone was respectful. No one was aggressive. And finally, the patient is asked what was learned. Melissa notes, I can attend social situations on my own where people are drinking and still be safe. Prolonged exposure therapy is empirically proven as an effective and highly successful treatment for PTSD. In addition to its efficacy, it is relatively easy for a counselor to implement and can be used in every setting. There are certain limitations and drawbacks with prolonged exposure therapy. These limitations pertain to the counselor, the client, and other external factors. In relation to the counselor, Van Minen mentioned that clinicians may have to work harder to engage the patients with the treatment. As well, a counselor may face challenges with their client who has more than one comorbid condition. Overall, these challenges pertain to a counselor being able to encourage a client to accept the therapy wholeheartedly. In relation to a client, some patients may require more help from the clinician to carefully modulate their emotional engagement with the trauma memory. In relation to external factors, Certain studies have indicated that the cost of the treatment may be prohibitive for some, yet it has been deemed better than other therapy techniques from a cost perspective. Le states, giving PTSD patients a choice of treatment appears to be cost effective. When choice is not possible, prolonged exposure therapy may provide a cost effective option over pharmacotherapy and with sertraline. PE is significantly effective due to its approach. Tull states, Prolonged exposure therapy consists of education about trauma, learning how to control your breathing, introceptive exposure, practice in the real world, in vivo exposure, and talking about your trauma, imaginal exposure, for stimulus discrimination and systematic desens desensitization. Walk-in states, the guidelines put forth by the VA, DOD, and the APA are recommendations for providers who treat individuals with PTSD and both strongly recommend PE, CPT, and trauma-focused CBT. As a team, we believe PE is a treatment of choice for PTSD. The treatment has a large evidence base showing effectiveness and simplicity in its design and implementation. The treatment is traumatic, uh, trauma focused, which means directly addressing memories of the traumatic event or thoughts and feelings related to the traumatic event. Watkin states that treatments with the strongest evidence should be the first line of treatment of PTSD whenever possible, always keeping in mind consideration of patient preferences and values, as well as the therapist's clinical expertise. Thank you for your time today as we reviewed CBT protocols for post-traumatic stress disorder.